Welcome to this Legal Aid New South Wales Law webinar on legal words for interpreters, criminal law words. My name is Bridget Barker and I work in the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. I'm here today with your presenter, Helen Shaw, who is a Senior Solicitor in the Legal Aid New South Wales Criminal Indictable Section. Good morning, Helen. Hi, Bridget. Hello, everybody. To begin, we would like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are broadcasting today. I'm broadcasting from the lands of the Widjidable Wyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation. We pay our respect to the elders of this land, both past and present, and we extend our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today or watching the recording. The purpose of this webinar is to explore common words used in criminal law settings. We have, as I said earlier, we have other webinars focusing on family and civil law words, and uh, we have previous recordings of those available on the Legal Aid YouTube channel. Helen, would you please introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, uh, so my name's Helen Shaw and I've been a criminal law solicitor since 1998 and I practice solely in criminal law. I work at Legal Aid, been working here since um, 2003 and I love my job and I love helping people. Um, so I do defence work, I don't prosecute people and um, Yep, so I enjoy, uh, also enjoy languages and I've studied a couple of languages and I'm presently learning Japanese. So I really respect the job that all of you do as interpreters and translators and your job is extremely important for us criminal law solicitors in court, in conference. Um, so much respect to, for the job that you do. Thank you, Helen. I should just mention, uh, someone did ask if we had an Auslan interpreter for this webinar today. Unfortunately, we, we don't and I apologise for that. So what we will cover during the webinar today, we, we're going to look at common words used in courts, criminal process words, legal document words, words used in criminal law, words about offences, types of sentences and where to get help with legal words. I'm just going to launch a poll now so that we can get a bit of understanding about your level of experience working with criminal law words. You should be able to answer the poll by clicking on your screen. Great, I can see everybody's responding to the poll now. Okay, I think everybody's responded, so I'll just close that off now and share the results. So Helen, it looks like the majority of people have either a lot or a little bit of experience and some don't have any, but are interested. That's great. Well, hopefully um, there'll be something for everybody and that um, I'll be able to clarify some questions that you may have or some things that you may have had to interpret in the past and hopefully everybody can learn something as well. Okay, I'll close the poll off now. So criminal law is the largest part of legal aid work and the largest section of legal aid. The criminal lawyers at legal aid assist people charged with criminal offences appearing before the courts. We also have specialist services, including the Children's Legal Service and Youth Hotline, but during today's webinar, we will just be talking about adult criminal law. If you interpret for young people in the children's court, there are some differences. We also have the drug court and prisoners legal service. 
We're interested to know, uh, sorry, we've just run the poll um, and I'll hand over to you, Helen, now, and we'll start with uh, the criminal courts. So every time a person is charged with an offence, whether it is a state-based offence or a commonwealth-based offence, they go to the local court. And I know we've got some people from interstate, um, so I'm some of the terminology might be more suited to New South Wales, but my point is that everybody starts at the lowest court, the lowest level court, and in New South Wales that is called the local court. I think Victoria, it might be county court. Uh, so everybody starts in the local court. A lot of things finish in the local court, but some types of charges cannot finish in the local court and they must go to district court. For example, an armed robbery or a sexual assault. Uh, some things go to Supreme Court like murder or terrorism. Terrorism is a Commonwealth charge. And some large tax frauds will go to Supreme Court. Uh, and so now if somebody appeals against either a conviction, they've been found guilty by a jury or a judge, they want to appeal that, they will have to go from district court or Supreme Court to the Court of Criminal Appeal, which is three judges listening to the appeal. And in uh, only a few cases each year are allowed to go to the High Court of Australia, which is the highest court across the whole country. But it's very hard to win the permission or the leave to get to the High Court. So the High Court has seven judges and there's only a few cases each year that uh, on a, some legal technicality, something that go to the High Court. Overwhelming overwhelming majority of cases will be finishing in the local court and everything starts there. So when we have um, a charge, somebody is arrested by police and they're not free to leave. So if police tell a person that they're under arrest, they're not free to walk away or free to leave the police station, uh, they go through the process. Police may arrest and then question somebody and they have a right to silence. So as an interpreter, you might be called by police on the phone and ask to provide some advice on the phone or you may have to go to the police station and be participating and interpreting during the interview that police have with the person. Uh, you might also have to interpret the person's legal rights, the right to silence, right to uh, speak to somebody, right to speak to a lawyer. You might need to interpret those those legal rights uh, on a document. Police might give you a document to translate to the person about their rights. Then police will make a decision whether they charge somebody or not. And if they charge somebody, then police have the choice of granting that person bail at the police station or not. So if the person is granted bail by police, then they leave the police station and they'll be given a future date to go to court. But if police refuse bail, then the person is brought to court within as soon as possible, within 24 hours. It might be that afternoon or it might be tomorrow morning. They are brought to court for them to possibly make an application for bail at the court and that's a local court. Remember I said everything starts in the local court or the lowest court so they'll be brought to court before a magistrate possibly to make an application or bail. Down the track uh, documents are served which is the brief of evidence and statements and everything and the person makes a decision about how they are going to plea to the charge. Not guilty guilty. 
Now, if they plead not guilty, then they go to trial or hearing. A hearing in the local court with a magistrate or trial in the district court or supreme court with a judge. If they plead guilty, then they go to sentence and you can be sentenced in the local court, can be sentenced in the district court, can be sentenced in the supreme court. And we'll be talking about sentences, types of sentences down uh, later on today. So I'll discuss all of that later on. So the role of police is to investigate, uh, investigate a crime, investigate an allegation, and they then have to produce the evidence, um, interview witnesses, interview the accused, and produce statements. And some of those witnesses will need interpreters, and some of the accused will also need interpreters and some people need support people for example if you if a person is indigenous they're allowed to have a support person or a friend and if somebody has a uh, cognitive impairment or intellectual impairment the police should be giving that person a support person as well and um, if the police realize somebody has a mental health issue they might also be required to have a support person. Police offer the person an opportunity to be interviewed and that interview is recorded by video and audio and that is a question and answer situation but the person can choose not to be interviewed and they have a right to silence and uh, it's really important from our point of view that the person understands their right to silence and police must tell them that they have a right not to give that interview. Um, sometimes you might hear COPS, C-O-P-S, which is a computer database, a computer police system. And every time there's an investigation, information is typed into the computer system by police and each investigation is given a number called an event number and police produce a document or a record of um, the investigation or things that are happening on the case. Every charge has an H number and you'll hear this a lot when you're in the local court interpreting. You'll hear the magistrate or the prosecutor or defence talk about H numbers. Every charge has an H number. And we don't know why it starts with the letter H. Nobody knows the reason it just does. So you'll hear the magistrates say, I'm looking at, you know, H number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's what it is. It's a document with the H number and a series of charges it might be one charge, it might be five charges, all under this one H number. So a person has been charged and it's like a reference number. It's given a number and that will be different to that event number that the, of the investigation, be a different number and we'll start with the letter H. And then if there's uh, more than one charge, under that reference number or H number, you'll have sequence one, sequence two, sequence three. So you might have an armed robbery, might be sequence one, and sequence two might be goods in custody, being stolen property, and sequence three might be resisting police when they're trying to arrest you. So there might be a series of charges, and they're called sequences. Okay, so bail or release applications. Uh, bail is when you're on bail, you are under conditional liberty. So you're not exactly free, but you're out. You're out of jail. You're not on remand, but you are not free to do anything that you want. 
you may have conditions like reporting to police, um, curfew, that you cannot leave home between certain hours. You might have conditions that you can't speak to certain people like witnesses in the case. Somebody might have to offer some money for you to get bail. That person is called the surety. And um, you might have various other conditions. The magistrate or the judge can impose various conditions on the bail. The bail is decided by the magistrate or the judge. And if you hear if something is a show cause offence, then it means that certain charges are under the bail legislation, they're called show cause. And it might be show cause because of the particular charge. It might carry life imprisonment or various other types of charges. Or it might be because the person was on bail already for something else. Or they might have been on parole, which is a part of the sentence. They've finished the jail part. Now they're in the community on parole, finishing their sentence under supervision, and then they've committed a new offence, maybe, allegedly. So that gives them an extra hurdle that they must give the magistrate or the judge reasons or justification why they should be given bail now on this new allegation. So I look at it as another hurdle. Um, section 74 is when you have already made a bail application in that court and you've been refused bail, so you have to justify what's new. Why are you making another application for bail when you just made one? So maybe circumstances have changed. Maybe the person did not have money to offer for bail before, but now they do. Or maybe their health has deteriorated, or maybe um, COVID has become a situation. And now that um, all the jails are locked down and you can't get visits, that changed the circumstances. So it has to be something new justifying why you should be able to let, be allowed to make another bail application. That's section 74 of the Bail Act. Um, Bail concerns, there's four things that the court looks at. Will this person commit another offence while on bail? How do you know that? What they look at is the person's criminal record. Have they, do they have a history of committing offences while on bail in the past? Is there a risk that they'll fail to appear in court? Again, look at the criminal record look at the criminal history. Do they have a habit of failing to appear in court in the past? If they do, then it's going to be hard to convince the court that they won't do that again. Another concern of the court is will they interfere with prosecution witnesses? Um, if there's something in their criminal record or there's something in this allegation that they have been harassing somebody um, or maybe the victim is a family member, then there might be a concern that they might cause some interference with witnesses. Uh, there are some of those bail concerns and you have to satisfy the court that there is not an unacceptable risk that you're going to do these things. Um, and if there is a risk, what can be what can be put in place to reduce that risk? Will a curfew help? Will, um, will money help? Will having a job, um, a job to go to reduce the risk of somebody committing an offence while on bail because they'll be too busy doing their job? Or things like that. What conditions can we offer to satisfy the court that we're not going to do any crime while on bail. Um, so there, that's that's bail, that's um, release applications. And um, so, and if you 
get refused in the local court, then you can have the chance of applying to the Supreme Court for bail and the same legislation applies. So that's bail or release applications. People at court. So you have the lawyers and they might be barrister or solicitor, senior counsel or Queen's Council, but now because the Queen of England died, we now have King's Council, KC, instead of QC. Um, in the local court, you won't know if the person is a solicitor or a barrister because in the local court in New South Wales, everybody just wears their suit. They don't wear the wig and they don't wear the robes or the black, the black robes. So... All the lawyers are just in their suits. They're not in special robes. But in the district court, the barristers will have their wig and their robes. And same with the Supreme Court, they'll have their wigs and their robes. Solicitors don't wear that. But both barristers and solicitors have law degrees. They're both, they're all lawyers. Magistrates are in the local court. Judges are in the district court and in the Supreme Court, we call them justice, justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, you also see police prosecutors who are sergeant, their rank of sergeant in the local court and they represent the community. Uh, and then you see crown prosecutors or crowns in the local court or the district court or the Supreme Court. The Crown might be a solicitor or they might be a barrister or both. So they work for the government and they are prosecutors. They're government employed prosecutors. Sometimes you have a private defence barrister being engaged or briefed by a government solicitor, a government prosecutor. So sometimes the private barrister will, will do both defence and prosecution work, but the state government has um, employed solicitors and barristers that always prosecute. And just like I am a state government employed defence solicitor, so legal aid is a government agency and so is the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. They're an office, uh, a, a state government employee, and the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution is a Commonwealth employed prosecution lawyers, solicitors, and barristers. You also have registrar in um, district court, local court, and Supreme Court, and they might do some return of subpoenas or some administrative tasks. So every court has a registrar and they're involved in not making big decisions in the case, but they might make some orders of when to serve some documents and give, give things new court dates, list things in court. Uh, and you also see the jury in the district or Supreme Court uh, jury, 12 citizens deciding the case. So that's the various people. And of course, interpreters are also in every court. You have interpreters and court staff. So I've mentioned a few of these. We have prosecution and they might be the police prosecutor. They might be a lawyer for the, working for the prosecution and they present the case on behalf of the community and they will cross-examine the accused if the accused gives evidence and they will uh, present evidence to the court, make submissions. The defence are also uh, lawyers. You might have a solicitor or a barrister or both and they also make submissions and they will cross-examine witnesses for the prosecution. The defendant is the person that is accused of the crime. They're also called the accused. And if they've pled guilty, then they're called the offender. Evidence in chief is when a person is giving their side of the story. So 
every witness that gives evidence, whether they are prosecution witness or defence witness, gives evidence in chief, and that is their side of the story, what they witnessed, what they heard, what they saw, or their side of the story. If they are the victim, the alleged victim gives evidence in chief, so does the accused. They give evidence in chief. And then they are cross-examined. So if a witness gives evidence, then they are cross-examined by the opposition, which are, they're all questions. So questions and answers in chief and in cross-examination. Uh, if something is fixed for mention, it means it's at, at court you're given a new date. So you're fixed, a date is fixed, a date is allocated, for mention and a mention is a very short appearance it might be a couple of minutes it is maybe the magistrate or judge is checking what stage the matter is up to do we have all the documents are we ready for the next step yet the magistrate or judge might give some orders might they might set a timetable for when they want things done by so it's very administrative you won't have a lot of uh, the matter will not be finalized at that point it's still ongoing it's really administrative and checking what stage we're up to and what needs to be done in the future um, hearing or trial so local court hearing is when somebody is pleading not guilty and it's staying in the local court and witnesses for prosecution and defence will be called to give evidence in chief and be cross-examined. The magistrate decides guilty or not guilty. Trial is in the district court or the Supreme Court and you can have a judge alone or you can have a jury trial. 12 people on the jury making a decision, listening to all the evidence guilty or not guilty. Um, if it's a judge without a jury, then the judge decides guilty or not guilty. A special fixture is something, it's usually something that's in, in the local court, um, is going to take a bit more time than usual. And so they want to secure, allocate a magistrate, it might take you four or five days, it has to run on that time and they want to make sure that the time is and court is set aside for that particular matter just to, to make sure that it it starts because local court other times you, you might have 10 sentence matters in in the one day before the one magistrate it might start at 10 o'clock it might start at 11 o'clock two o'clock three o'clock you don't know when you're going to start and sometimes things, the court is so busy that you don't actually start that day and it has to be adjourned for another day. So special fixture locks it in. Have all your witnesses be ready to go on that specific date. That's um, special fixture. So a committal hearing is in the local court. It's an application has to be made to cross-examine some witnesses, not every witness in the case, but specific witnesses on specific defined issues. It might be identification. It might be cross-examining some people on what they say they saw somebody do. And there might be an issue whether it's really your client, the accused, or, or maybe it's really the description fits somebody else better. So you might be applying to cross-examine a few people or an expert, for example, uh, on specific evidence or their opinion on some evidence and a very narrow specific issue that's at a committal hearing. It's not so frequent. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, strategically, you might wish to do that in the local court to test the, the evidence, to test the witnesses, or strategically, you might wait to let's deal with that when we get to the higher court, the district or Supreme Court, and let's just listen to that in front of the jury. Don't, 
don't really want to give those people a chance of fixing any problems in their evidence it, because it, they might have time to fix the problems if you expose the problems. So there really has to be a strategic decision. That's committal hearing. Call over is, again, a bit like a mention. It's you have these a lot in the district court and it'll be a couple of days before the trial is due to start. So you have a call over. Usually on the, in the Sydney District Court, you have a call over on the Thursday. Judge just wants to check, are you ready to start on Monday? And there might, if there's any issue or legal argument that has to be done, it helps the court work out who is definitely ready to begin. Um, do we need the jury panel for Monday or do we are we looking at starting on Wednesday? So it's really looking at what is ready to start, what still needs to be done, uh, who's ready and who is not. So that's the call over. An interim hearing or order. You have these a lot in apprehended domestic violence orders or um, it's sort of temporary. And it's in the meantime before you have a final hearing. So there'll be some orders made, like don't do this, don't do that, not allowed to approach the home of the person. In the meanwhile, until a final order is made. So there'll be temporary orders, interim orders, or there may have to be a bit of an argument about it or a hearing in the interim until a final order is made um, so it's just it's temporary it's not that the final decision hasn't been made on that yet but AVO is a very common um, proceeding where there will be some interim orders police are seeking interim orders and you may have to have some argument about that until a final decision is made an adjournment is a postponement of a final decision. So every time at the beginning of the case, go to court, mention the matter, you're waiting for the documents to be served, the matter has to be adjourned because you don't have any documents yet, police still have to serve the documents. And so the matter is adjourned until a future date and orders are made for the prosecution to serve documents on the defence. That's an adjournment. Um, or something may not be ready. It may, the matter may need to be adjourned because the both parties are not ready on that day and so the matter cannot be finalised yet. That's an adjournment. Postponement, you get a new date. Stay of proceedings, uh, not not very usual, a bit uncommon, but there may be reasons, example, somebody, an accused person is very old and their health is not good. So there may be an application by the accused lawyers to stay the proceedings, stop, stop the proceedings because of the health. Or maybe the application is because there are very important documents which have not been served on the defence and without those documents, it's impossible to properly defend the matter. So the person might make an application to stop the matter temporarily until those documents have been provided. Or maybe the person has run out of money and they're also not eligible for legal aid to fund their case. And so until they've got a chance to get some more money, uh, then asking for the proceedings to be temporarily put on hold or stayed until they've got a chance to get some extra money to pay for their legal fees. So that's stay of proceedings. It's a temporary hold or postponement or stopping proceedings. Can be permanent or can be temporary. Uh, forfeiture application, this is usually made and, and confiscation orders. These are made by the police or the prosecution. There might be 
uh, to do with proceeds of crime. So somebody has been found guilty or pled guilty to proceeds uh, to, to a drug offence, for example, and they've earned a lot of money from the sale of drugs, then, or they've bought some property with, with criminal funds, funds that are made from a crime, and the police or the prosecution have made an application to confiscate that property, confiscate that money, or forfeit, forfeit the money, forfeit the property. So the court can make an order that, um, that the money or the property has to be confiscated or forfeited. And sometimes, and also you have destruction orders to destroy the drugs if it's a drug case because police seize it and then it has to be destroyed. Uh, jurisdiction, this can be the couple of meanings of this word, this English word. Jurisdiction can be the location. Is it New South Wales jurisdiction? Is it Queensland? Is it Samoa? Is it the United States? Jurisdiction is the territory of where the crime happened, where the court is. So, uh, for example, if a case happened, a, a crime happened in Victoria, then Victoria should be the place where it is prosecuted, not New South Wales. Um, or does the judge have or court have jurisdiction to hear the matter? Should this be in the local court, the district court, or the Supreme Court? Should this be in Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, or overseas? You know, we might be talking about import or export drugs. Um, should this be, is this the correct jurisdiction? Does the magistrate or the judge have the power or the jurisdiction to hear this matter. So jurisdictional error, if the person does not have power to hear it or this territory, this court does not have the power, then there will be an error if they make a decision which they didn't have the power to make. Judicial error is something where the judge or the magistrate has made a mistake about the law and that may have to be appealed to the higher court. So magistrate makes a mistake, it can be appealed to the district court or it could be appealed to the, straight to the Supreme Court. District court mistakes get appealed to the Court of Criminal Appeal. So that's judicial error. The, the judge or the magistrate has made a mistake. Uh, summary offence is less serious than other offences and it's always finished in the local court, the lowest court. Uh, and there's legislation called the Summary Offences Act. And some of these only have a fine, they only have a fine um, penalty, which is a fine. They're much less serious than other types of crimes. Uh, for example, indictable offence, Indictable offence is something that carries two years imprisonment or more, a maximum of two years imprisonment. Um, an indictment is a document which is produced by the prosecution and it is a piece of paper which is handed up to the court and the charge, the criminal charge is written on that document. And when a person is arraigned, or at arraignment in the district or the Supreme Court, the charge which is written on the indictment is read out to the person and they plead guilty or not guilty. Now, in court, if you are in the district court or the Supreme Court, ask the court, ask the defence or the prosecution lawyer to give you a copy of this document, the indictment, because you will need to interpret when that is read out to the person the judge's associate or the judge will read out the charges on indictment and you as interpreter will need to interpret those charges and the accused person will be asked how do you plead guilty or not guilty and then they say guilty or not guilty so for your sake to make it better and easier for you in court, ask for a copy of that piece of paper so that you can 
see the words as they're also being said in court. You have every right to ask for that. So ask for the piece of paper. They should give it to you without you needing to ask for it. But if they don't, please ask for it. Um, so that's the indictment. Um, and if somebody is indicted, that's the process of them being um, accused or they're, they're indicted, that that indictment is produced. They're indicted on a particular charge. It's more serious. And the arraignment process is the process of having those charges read out and the pleas entered. If somebody is acquitted, then they are found not guilty. So the verdict is not guilty. It means they are acquitted of the charge. Or to acquit somebody is to find them not guilty. It might be by the jury or it might be a judge only without a jury that acquits the person or the magistrate can acquit or find somebody not guilty. Penalty is, it could be a fine, it could be a jail sentence, it could be some kind of um, community order, community-based order, and we will discuss types of sentences or penalties later in this talk. We'll discuss those later. Remand is... Uh, you can it can be a verb and a noun so when somebody is remanded in custody it means that they bail refused or refused bail and they are held or kept in jail on remand waiting for their case to go through the court and they might be found not guilty and then they're released or they might get bail and then they're released on bail or they might be found guilty and then they are sentenced. So a person can be remanded in custody or they can be on remand. And if they're on remand, they are bail refused, waiting for their case to go through the process in court. Custody, again, a couple of meanings of this. You can be in custody or in police custody, meaning you are not free to go you are you might be in the police cells at the police station in custody or you might be at the jail in custody you're under the control of the police or under the control of corrective services who run the jail you're in custody something can also be in somebody's custody like property can be in somebody's custody they've got control over it. So that's custody. Uh, verdict is verdict is guilty or not guilty or not criminally responsible on the grounds of mental or cognitive impairment. That's the verdict. That's the decision based on the evidence. Guilt is a person guilty or not guilty or not criminally responsible because of a mental or co cognitive impairment. A jury can make the verdict or a judge alone can make a verdict or the magistrate can make the verdict. Sentence, and we'll be discussing sentences more in more detail later, but a sentence is a punishment. A sentence is a penalty. And there's different types of sentences. It can be jail or um, conditional good behaviour various types of sentences. A prison sentence has several parts. I'll go into this in more depth after, but there's a non-parole period, which is the minimum term in jail that the person must serve, that the magistrate will, or judge will set. Example, two years non-parole period and two years on parole, which parole is in the community under supervision. It's still part of a sentence, but it's in the community under supervision. Head sentence is the total of those two components. So if it's a two years non-parole and two years parole, a four-year head sentence. It's, it's the maximum time, the total head sentence, the combination of both the parole and non-parole period. 
a black direction. This might be something that you hear in a trial, if you're interpreting in a trial and the jury say we're stuck, we can't make a decision, we can't all agree on what the decision should be, what the verdict should be, then the judge will give them what's called a black direction and tells them try harder, listen to each other, keep discussing it, try to come to a unanimous decision, all 12 of you agreeing. So that's called a black direction. And the reason it's called a black direction, it's the name of a case. So it's the name of a case in the past. A person's surname was black. Hung jury is when those 12 people on the jury cannot reach uh, 12 people agreeing on the verdict. Or if it's majority verdict, they cannot agree 11 to 1. There's, they're split, they're undecided, they're unable to reach a decision that they all agree on. That's hung jury. The consequence of that is you have to start again with a new jury, sometimes a new judge. You have to start all over again, hung jury. And more words are to charge somebody that's a verb, so police charge somebody with an allegation, charge somebody with committing a crime, or a charge can be a noun. So somebody might have five charges, five accusations. They're charged with a crime and police lay five charges against the person. So you get charged by police. Form 1 offences, you will hear this, you could hear this in the local court or the district court, maybe Supreme Court, but not often. Form 1 offences are charges which the person admits their guilt that they've done it, but they are asking the court to take them into account when they are sentenced for a more, a, a different charge, usually a more serious charge. Um, they're usually related to the crime and the form one it's a document which is called form one it's, it's a it's a one or two page document that the person signs and it's given to the court saying um, acknowledge my guilt and I'm asking that you take into account my guilt for this offense when you sentence me for something else an example is um break and enter offence, somebody's broken into a home, they've stolen a wallet, and then they've used the credit cards at a shop. So they're charged for those frauds or obtaining money by deception using that credit card, which is not theirs. And they admit their guilt, but instead of getting a separate sentence for each time they used the credit card at the shop, they are asking the court to put those charges on a form one document they admit their guilt and ask the court to take that into account when they are sentenced for the break and enter offense and the court will take into account they've done all these things but give them one sentence all wrapped up together a backup charge is something that is like an alternative to the main charge. And the best example I can give is you have an accusation of supply prohibited drugs and a certain quantity, it might be quite a lot, and you're found with those drugs in your possession. So police charge you with both possessing the drug and supplying the drug or the police are saying, look, you can't possibly have been using that for yourself. It can't be personal use. So they charge you with both the possession of it and deem supply, assuming that you were going to use, uh, sorry, assuming you were possessing that for the purpose of supplying it to somebody else. So the possession is the backup charge to the supply charge. That's just one example. It's an alternative. It's a less serious alternative. Um, sentence assessment report is, or SAR, so you might hear the word SAR. Sentence assessment report is ordered by the court. 
and it is written by corrective services and it is an assessment of you might they assess whether the person's eligible for community service um, or eligible for home detention they'll talk about drug and alcohol problems gambling problems bit of background personal background they might also do an assessment about risk of reoffending on certain types of offences so the report goes straight to the court and um, they also write down what the person's attitude to the offence is so this is used for sentencing uh, and it goes straight to the court so there's a real danger if the report is bad um, you can get a bad report and it can really affect the sentence. Agreed facts are a doc is a document that is like a summary of all the evidence in the brief, a few pages which the prosecution and the defence agree that this is an accurate summary of the offence and the person is pleading guilty. Instead of giving the court 10 lever arch folders of documents you can summarize it in a few pages and let the court read that document they're agreed facts and that is what the person will be sentenced on just though that summary agreed facts burden of proof is who has to prove something in court the prosecution or the defense the prosecution have the burden or the onus of proving the elements or the ingredients of an offence beyond a reasonable doubt, um, you know, that, that this person did rob that store on that day. Um, and it, that's up to the prosecution to prove it, or that this person did cause the death of somebody on a particular day at a particular place that their action caused the death um, if it's a mental health issue then the balance of probabilities comes into play so the defense must prove on the balance of probabilities that when they did that action when they committed that crime that they did so because of a mental impairment so you need the evidence supporting that on the balance of probabilities. Beyond a reasonable doubt is never explained by the court. It's there shouldn't be any other reasonable explanation. If there's another reasonable explanation, then the person should be found not guilty. Uh, if the prosecution cannot get rid of some other reasonable explanation, for the crime or for this thing happening um, it's a very high standard but the courts unfortunately never explain it to the jury balance of probabilities is also civil so uh, avos are civil not criminal but they're often connected to criminal cases but they are balance of probabilities the prosecution only have to prove on the balance of probabilities it's like weighing something up it's just a little bit a little bit as long as it's over 50 percent then balance of probabilities um, so mental impairment defenses and avos are balance of probabilities objective seriousness is something you hear in sentencing all the time the court has to decide how serious is this offence, this example of this offence, example break and enter, compared to other types? Is it well planned or not? Is there any violence or not? Have there been injuries or not? How many people were involved? Was it nighttime or daytime? Um, how much money was stolen? A lot or a little? Compare this offence. How serious is this example of the offence compared to others that the court has heard? The more serious, the worse it is, obviously. The less serious, then perhaps the penalty should be less. It's comparing this offence to other types of offence, leaving aside for a minute the personal circumstances 
of the individual who's done it. So it's just looking at the facts alone. Special circumstances, you'll hear this in sentencing. Um, if so, you're interpreting in sentencing, you'll hear this in court. Looking at the personal circumstances of the person, of the individual that's being sentenced. Special circumstances, the age of the person, the mental health of the person, um, cognitive issues, they might be a refugee, they might be first time in jail, they might be very young, very, young, very old, all sort, various personal circumstances which might make jail much harder for them. They might be separated from family, they might have no family in Australia, things like that, special circumstances. It allows the court to reduce the time in custody to reduce the non-parole period and increase the time on parole. It alters the structure of the sentence. I'll explain that later on again, but that's what special circumstances is and that's something that you'll hear when you're interpreting during sentence proceedings. Precedent is a past case, a past decision, a past um, court case and we bring in precedents to make an argument, to rely on past cases when we're making arguments for a current case, rely on legal precedents, something that's happened before to support our argument, to make it, to do this now in this case. Um, and then you have common law and statute law. So Australia borrowed law from England um, when England colonised Australia, then we borrowed their law as well. Then Australian New South Wales or federal Queensland, Victoria have their own parliaments, have their own politicians, and they create laws, they create statutes. So the Crimes Act that I'm dealing with, both state and Commonwealth, their statutes, their parliament politician made laws. And so we look up sections of the legislation, sections of acts, their statutes, and you can find them on the internet, the different legislation. Um, common law is very much tradition based, not always written, but you have cases that rely on common law as well. But well, a lot of that we borrowed from England, we borrowed from the past. So um, I think we might be, we ready for a break now? Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, perfect timing. I was just going to say that we'll uh, pause the recording and take a break for five minutes. So uh, it's about 11.06. We'll come back at 11 minutes past 11 and um, start the webinar again. Okay. Everybody, I'm hoping that everybody's been able to come back. And I'll just move the slide on so that we can go to the next slide. Okay, so thanks, Helen. These are some documents um, that you'll hear some of these names maybe, uh, either in court or sometimes you might hear it during conference. An affidavit is a document which is uh, a sworn or either on oath or affirmed, affirmation, affirmed document. Um, it is evidence in court. It might be by... Um, the accused person, and it can also be by other witnesses or lawyers as well. So often I write an affidavit setting out uh, facts of something. So it is, it becomes evidence. We give that to the court and it becomes, I swear, or I affirm that it's the truth. And I have to have a witness sign my sign, uh, oh, sorry, witness, witness my signature. And it, it's a crime to make a false declaration. And sometimes I will get a client to, I'll help a client prepare one. 
and they might we might use that for their um, court case as well um, maybe some personal background I might get some information you can also attach documents behind the affidavit um, yeah there might be a medical certificate or various attachments as part supporting what you are saying in the document so on the right hand side there you can see the word notice of motion every time you do a notice of motion which is literally a one-page document seeking orders from a court or asking the court to make certain orders every time you do one of those you have to have an affidavit in support so the affidavit sets out maybe the history of the case for example um, if if I'm waiting still waiting for an expert report from a psychiatrist there's been some delay um, and I don't have that doc, I don't have that report yet, and I need that report for my case. I might need to lodge a notice of motion asking the court to make orders uh, to change the trial date, to vacate the trial date. And then in my affidavit, I have to justify why I'm asking for that. I have to make my reasons set out my reasons and I might need to attach some documents they might be emails that I have sent or received I might need to attach some documents to support my argument and ex ex support why I'm asking for something so lawyers we have to do notices of motion a lot notice of motion with an affidavit in support but if I'm uh, doing a sentence for example I'm appearing for a client for a sentence I might just get the client to do an affidavit I might get them to tell their life story in writing I type it they they talk I witness their signature and I give that to the court the prosecution can of course ask to cross-examine the person or they might not so or other witnesses it might be the mother of a client. I might get the mother to do an affidavit explaining some background information about my client. Um, and that's the evidence. It's in writing, that's the evidence, rather than talking in court. Uh, the deponent is the person that makes that affidavit. So if I am swearing or affirming the affidavit, I am the deponent. Statutory declaration is very similar. Um, you'll see these in everyday life um, at the post office, passport application, when you incoming passenger card, when you travel and arrive back in Australia, there's a, that um, the incoming customs declaration, passenger card declaration is a statutory declaration and it's an offence to, to not, you know, are you bringing any food and blah, blah, blah. It's an offence to lie on that. That's a statutory declaration. Um, so statutory declarations are, you, you do them every day without even thinking that that's a statutory declaration. Is this true and correct? Tax, your tax um, returns involve a statutory declaration. Again, they're legal documents, but they are sort of legal documents um, and it's a crime to make a false declaration for court we use affidavits um, I know family law as well we use a lot of affidavits and um, oath or affirmation just like when you are sworn in or you give an affirmation in court before you interpret you that is also part of the affidavit you you witness you swear that it's true and correct or you affirm that it's true and correct or when a witness um, and an interpreter gives uh, does their job in court you have to be making an oath or an affirmation and so does the jury the jury makes an oath or an affirmation to decide 
their verdict based on the evidence. And so oath is meant to be a religious one, promising to God to tell the truth or whichever religion you believe in, telling um, it's a religious promise to tell the truth and an affirmation is non-religious, but it's still a promise to the court to tell the truth. And a subpoena is becomes a court order. So it's a order to produce documents to the court or it's an order to attend court to give evidence. So witnesses are served with subpoenas to attend court to give evidence and it is an offence not to turn up. And there's a warning on the document. You know, if you fail to attend court, a warrant may be issued for your arrest. So that's a subpoena to attend court. There's also subpoena to produce documents. So I issue subpoenas a lot and I might subpoena the hospital for records, medical records. I might subpoena police to produce documents which they haven't given to me in court. And that's a, it's an order that those documents must be produced. It's a court, becomes a court order, but I file the document or the prosecution files the subpoena in court it's stamped by the registry and the it is becomes a court order to do what it's what it's telling you to do so that's those documents offenses against the person so in the crimes act of new south wales you see offenses a group there's property offenses there's offenses which are against people um, which often you know, often involve violence so common assault is maximum penalty in new south wales is two years maximum penalty it's the least serious of the types of offenses against persons um, it it doesn't have to be physical it, it can be verbal, it could be shouting at somebody, it, but it could also be hitting somebody or spitting on somebody or slapping somebody. There may or may not be an injury as a result of this. And if there is an injury, it's the lowest level of injury, um, considered the lowest level of injury. And um, yeah, so it doesn't have to be physical. But it's, the idea is that it's putting somebody in fear. It, it has the potential of putting somebody in fear by doing that. So it might be verbal, it might be physical. Maximum penalty, two years in prison. Assault, occasioning actual bodily harm, or ABH, actual bodily harm, is a type of assault. And the actual bodily harm could be a bruise, it could be a scratch, could be a red mark. It's something that will go away or something that it is something that will heal. It will not be permanent damage. It's, but it's more serious than a common assault, which may involve no physical injury. So actual bodily harm is physical of some description. And the maximum penalty for that is five years in prison in New South Wales. Grievous bodily harm is much more serious than actual bodily harm. Grievous bodily harm, the definition is really serious injury. And it has a broad range. So it could be, you know, it could be a cut, it could be a broken bone, a broken rib, broken jaw. Um, it can be very, very serious injury, or it can be you know, anywhere from a bit more than a bit more than uh, scratch and stuff, but it will take longer to heal. So it is more serious. And this can be very serious penalties as well. You can have intentionally inflicting grievous bodily harm, meaning to do it, having the intention to cause that really serious injury can be um, 25 year maximum penalty recklessly doing it so not intending but being pretty careless and reckless about it 
that's that can be um, 10 year maximum penalty. So there's a big difference between what the person intended to do. Did they mean for that to happen? Mean to cause that really serious injury? Or were they reckless about it, um, not careful about it? Then th the difference in penalty is very large. A fray is can two or more people involved in, often it's a fight of some description, um, can be a lot of people or it can just be two people, which cause, sorry, involved in some sort of activity, usually a fight, um, may or may not be physical, often it is, and it sort of puts people in fear. It has the potential to put reasonable people in the community in fear of safety, even if nobody else is hurt. Um, but often the word brawl is there. So brawl is not actually a criminal charge. A fray is, but that's really what an affray is about. Funny enough, it doesn't actually have to be in public. Uh, it, it can be an affray in, in somebody's backyard, but it, it's behaviour that can have the potential to put onlookers, if there are any, put people in, in fear. So that's what an affray or an, a brawl is. Sexual offences, the... Law, the Crimes Act, um, these are in the Crimes Act of New South Wales, and this has changed a lot over the years, and it, it um, definitions and defences and, and ex explanations that the judge has to give to the jury have changed a lot over the years. And so this constantly gets updated, and uh, even us lawyers, we have to keep learning the changes and there's no time limit for these on when somebody can be charged so you might be interpreting or I might be representing somebody that is charged with allegations that date back to the 1960s 1970s 1980s they're historical sexual offenses and I we have a lot of these cases they're very old cases and the words the language may be very different to what it is now so because the law has kept on changing and it can be very confusing keeping up to date with the laws the changes in the language so sexual assault or rape in the past and i'm, I'm not sure about other states again this is new south wales in the past rape was only male against female victim and specifically rape involved penile vaginal penetration very limited definition but sexual assault is much broader so there can be male there are male victims of sexual assault there are female victims of sexual assault and it is not just yet yeah, not just male perpetrator doing this to a female it can be female doing it to a male it can be uh, sexual assault can involve inserting objects or finger into somebody's body it can be sexual assault can be putting something in somebody's mouth anus vagina, various body parts. It's penetration of some description in a sexual way. So it's, as you can understand, that the definition is much broader. So the idea is to protect many more victims because in the past, many people, things happened to people, but they were not protected by the law. So there are females accused of sexual assault there are males accused of sexual assault and there are both female and male victims, adult and children victims. So the definition is now very broad and that is because it needs to protect more people and prosecute females as well as males. 
sexual touching used to be called indecent assault but if if we're dealing with charges that occurred alleged to have occurred 10 years ago you may still hear the word indecent assault so it's really a touching touching of the genital areas of male or female that's sexual touching the maximum penalty is less for that than if there is some sort of sexual assault penetration involved a sexual act used to be called an act of indecency a sexual act it's something that's done to somebody else that's not wanted there's no consent with this it's no permission to do it and it might be it can be done in private or in public but it's a sexual act it might be masturbation or something like that it's a sexual act done towards somebody or in front of somebody and that person is not agreeing to this happening in front of them or to them sexual harassment is not a crime but there is civil lawsuits against this and it can, could be any one of those activity could be any one of those um, but it's often in a workplace and there's allegations of it might also be sexual jokes things like or um sexual can can be touching but it can also be verbal comments and jokes which aren't funny they're, so they're not really jokes but that sort of behavior and it's often in a workplace that that happens and there can be civil lawsuits anti-discrimination lawsuits against sexual harassment child protection register when somebody is convicted found guilty or pleaded guilty to uh, sexual assaults or sexual offences against a child then they are placed on a register which restricts their movements can restrict where they live they may not be able to have internet access they have to they may have to register every phone every phone number they go to police police check internet accounts email accounts um, sim cards everything they need permission to do anything and that is so that oh, and permission to they may not be able to live near a school work near a school work in a school they have to, there are all these restrictions on what they can or cannot do and that is they're placed on a register and and given uh, limits on what they can or cannot do and they have to go to police and get permissions and police monitor their behavior and you can be charged if you break those rules and they're very very strict rules i mentioned before permission so i'm now talking about consent so obviously sexual assault sexual touching sexual act it's a crime if there's no consent. It's a crime if there's no permission. If two people are agreeing, if, they, if, if a person is consenting, then it's not a crime. Unless if it's a child, person under 16 does not have the legal ability to consent. So if the person is under 16 years of age, male or female under 16 does not have the legal ability to consent or agree to sexual intercourse or sexual touching. So if a person is accused of doing something with a person under 16 and they know or should have known, reason should have known that the person was under 16, then it's a crime. If the person honestly and reasonably believed that the person was above 16 and, and maybe the person has told them that they're above 16 or maybe they've got an internet profile saying I'm 21 years old their age might appear different and the person reasonably believes that that there is agreement to do things then that may be a defense to the charge but it 
but that would be a matter for the jury to decide. So consent is consent cannot happen if a person is drunk, so drunk, or so affected by drugs, alcohol, asleep. If they're unconscious, if they're asleep, then it's impossible to consent. So there's a whole section about consent in the Crimes Act legislation. A crime of this sort might be aggravated because of the person's age, if they're under 16, because of the person's intellectual capacity. If there's an intellectual impairment, then that may be a is an aggravating factor it makes it more serious it's aggravated the penalty will be higher makes it more serious or if there's if the accused person is in company with somebody else one or more other people then it's aggravated because they're in company it could also be aggravated because of intoxication by drugs or alcohol of the of the alleged victim. So there's various ways that, that an offence may be aggravated. Uh, it may also be aggravated if they're, if the person is taking care of, like a teacher and a student, parent and a child, things like that. That can also aggravate an offence in, in a position of power or um, power or looking after that person, a role of authority. So that can also aggravate an offence and the penalties will be worse. Age of consent, I mentioned this, 16 and above. 16 and above is the age of consent in New South Wales. And I touched on historical, that means something that's not just recent, and we are getting cases back from the 1960s. There's no statute of limitations. There's no six-year time limit like some civil cases. It doesn't matter when it happened. The allegation can still be brought. And we do have current cases where we have, you know, I have an 80-year-old 80, 80 client charged with offences that happened in the 1960s. So people decide years later to go to police and then charges are laid. Then we have offences against property. So when you look through the Crimes Act, you'll see different subheadings. So you'll see things like theft or steal from person, larceny. There's so When you look at the Crimes Act, it's first got created by Parliament in 1900. So you, you can imagine the sorts of property and sorts of crimes happening then. You've still got cattle, stealing cattle, still have it now because you still have farmers and cattle being stolen. But you also have a lot of crimes that were more common back in 1900 than they are now. And the types of property and types of stealing can change. Now you have internet fraud and identity theft and um, things that are not physical. Property may be intellectual as well and creative and intellectual property. This type of stealing can be over the internet. It may not be physical stealing, but it's it's done over electronically and and over internet so crimes change and so the law has to often catch up with the way that crime is happening steal from person is like a bag snatch you're on the street and somebody snatches your backpack or your handbag and often it's done without violence that's the difference between steal from person and robbery a robbery is either actual violence might be a punch or threat of violence, give me your bag or I'll hit you. Threat of violence or actual violence, that's robbery. Steal from person, it, the, it's an example, a bag snatch. Um, theft is, yes, yeah, stealing. It may be from the person or it might be, you know, stealing something from a shop, not actually stealing from a person's 
body, um, theft from a shop or a company, things like that. So larceny, stealing is larceny. There's shoplifting again. Larceny carries a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment. Um, but often you, you won't get that penalty, but that's the maximum. And it will depend on how much, what's stolen, what's the value, what's the value of the property. Um, shoplifting will usually be dealt with. That will be finished in the local court, the shoplifting. Again, value can change from, you know, 50 cents to thousands of dollars, the value. So that will affect the seriousness of what the court thinks, how serious this is, depending on the value, how much. Robbery, I mentioned this, is it's a stealing with a threat or actual threat of violence or actual violence and a stealing. Robbery in company, more than one person does this. Two or more people do this robbery. So it's more serious than if it was one person doing it. Robbery in company will have a higher penalty than robbery with one person. Burglary or break and enter. We don't have burglary in New South Wales, but I think maybe Queensland does. I'm not sure about Victoria. But burglary, I think it used to be at night time, so we used to, but I think the difference was one was at night time and one was in the daytime. But anyway, break and enter can be any time of day. And break in does not have to be wrecking or smashing the window. It can be opening a door which is unlocked but closed, or it can be sliding a window open, uh, pushing a door open more that that's breaking or it can be breaking the lock smashing causing damage um break and enter break enter and steal so you, you get a lot of these in the local court and um in the district court as well a lot of break and enters in homes fraud many types of fraud it can be a fraud identity theft or um, oh, sorry, the slide's just gone. Um, yeah. So can we go back? Yeah. Um, fraud can be credit card fraud, stealing somebody's credit card and using using that credit card at various shops can be many types of frauds. Yeah, identity theft, prop, uh, frauds, forging signatures on documents, things like that. Fraud has a wide variety. Fraud can be Centrelink, Commonwealth fraud, um, fraud, committing a fraud against Centrelink, claiming benefits which you're not entitled to, different frauds like that. Um, hacking, very common at the moment. Hacking computers, identity thefts, those sorts of things, they can cost a fortune for pe people lose a lot of money with those, obviously. Um, and obtaining money by deception is, is a type of fraud and it's using somebody else's credit card, pretending to be somebody else, using somebody else's identity to get something, whatever that benefit is, whether it's money or whether it's um, using their identity to open up a bank account, using their, their identity to, to get something, to fool somebody into pretending, believing that you are somebody else um, and using their, their money, their identity to get some property or some money. So illicit drugs are illegal drugs could be cocaine, ecstasy, heroin, they're against the law, cannabis, those sorts of things. Uh, and different drugs will um, have different, uh, different quantities of drugs will attract different penalties, different maximum penalties. So a small amount will not be punished as much as a kilo or two kilos of drugs. Drugs can be imported or exported, importing drugs is a commonwealth offence. 
um, also importing chemicals to produce illegal drugs is also an offence, and that's Commonwealth. So anything imported is Commonwealth offence. Possession of drugs, possession of drugs um, is a state offence. So you have state prosecution and Commonwealth prosecution. Possessing drugs is not as high a penalty as supplying drugs. So supplying drugs has a much higher penalty, maximum penalty than possessing the drug. If it's deemed supply, then it involves possession of a drug, which police say is of a high enough quantity, which is too much for you to possibly be using yourself. So they assume that you're possessing it for the purpose of selling it or giving it to somebody else. I should just say that it is a, it is a criminal offence to give somebody drugs and often at parties you'll have people sharing a drug. That's the supply of drug, even though no money is given. It's a, an offence to share a drug even if you don't get money for it. So it's supplying drugs when somebody is sentenced for that, the submission will be that, well, they're sharing it, they didn't make a profit from it. It's lower level than if somebody is making profit from selling the drug. Being in possession of a drug for the purpose of supply is deemed supply, but if you're in possession of the drug for personal use, then that is a defence to the allegation that you are deemed or assumed to be supplying it. So sometimes somebody has six grams of methamphetamine in their possession. They are arrested and they're charged by police with supply, deemed supply of the six grams of methamphetamine, which is ice. They might argue, well, no, I'm not supplying it. I use that drug and that is my defence. I'm using, I possess that drug because I use that drug. I've just bought it from the drug dealer and I am going to go home and use that and that is my drug. I use that. It'll take me one week to use that. That is, that is uh, I'm guilty of possession, but I'm not guilty of supply because I was never going to supply that drug wasn't going to give it to anybody, wasn't going to share it and was not going to sell the drug. That's that's guilty of possession but not guilty of deemed supply. It's up to the accused to satisfy the court that on the balance that that is what they were using the drug for personal use. There are different types, different levels of supply, though. There is supply large commercial quantity of a drug, and that carries life imprisonment. It's very, very serious charge. Uh, large commercial quantity, commercial quantity, trafficable quantity, indictable quantity, small quantity. They're different thresholds, different maximum penalties, and different drugs have different quantities. So this is in the Drug and Mis Drug Misuse and Trafficking Act, 1985, and you have a whole schedule of different drugs and different weights and different maximum penalties um, and supply and possession have different penalties as well. So um, Drug Misuse and Trafficking Act. But the penalties for supplying prohibited drugs, the maximum penalties are very high. Driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, uh, these will be dealt with in the local court. If there's no chance of going to jail for this, because maybe it's the first offence, then um, legal aid will not usually represent the person because we represent people where there's a chance of going to jail. So I don't actually do many of these driving under the influence cases because as a legal aid solicitor, this will not normally attract jail if it's the first time. Same with 
prescribed concentration of alcohol, PCA. You have low range, mid range, high range. The danger of going to jail, though, is much higher with high range PCA because especially if there's been an accident, especially if there's a death involved, then, of course, you'll be on other charges of maybe dangerous driving or negligent driving causing death as well. So some of those charges I don't deal with very much because they're not something that legal aid will represent people in because the risk of going to jail is lower depending on the person's criminal history um, but supply prohibited drug yes very common possess prohibited drug yes um, and merit program is a like a diversion in the local court if somebody goes through this drug related counseling program then goes to the course does the course comes back to court having completed the course then the court may be more lenient on sentence and allow them to stay in the community because they've completed this course domestic and family violence so you will uh, perhaps have to interpret in these matters they're in the local court they often connected with a criminal charge, but not always. These are civil in nature, but as I said, they're very often connected with criminal charge or family court. Um, so they are highly connected to what I do. Domestic violence, family violence, um, sometimes they're not family at all. They might be two strangers involved. Um, but so they'll, they may not be domestic or family violence, but there may still be an apprehended violence order because there's been a crime of violence against somebody and the police may choose to take out an apprehended personal violence order against the accused. The terminology, uh, PINOP, P person in need of protection. That's what PINOP stands for. Apprehended domestic violence order will be where people live in the same household or are related. Apprehended personal violence order will often not be not be the neighbour. Oh, sorry, sorry. Apprehended personal violence order will be often the neighbour or um, somebody that's not within the family or not related. Um, but they may still be the victim of a threat or violence. The accused person or the defendant can consent to the orders without admission, without admitting guilt, can consent to them. And if they do that, then the order will be made 12 months, two years, five years. Or they can go to hearing. They can defend it and take it to hearing in the local court and the magistrate will decide whether, whether listen to the evidence and decide whether to make final orders or not. When the matter first comes to court, it's the police have applied for a provisional order. And then when once it is adjourned to the next court date, it becomes interim, interim order. So they're temporary, they're in the meantime but you're, there are orders in place and any breaking of those orders, any breach or breaking those rules is a crime. So that's where the criminal law becomes connected again. It is a crime to break these rules. It's a crime to breach the orders and a breach of AVO is a very serious thing and can carry jail. So there are conditions and any breaches the police can charge a person with a crime and you can get jail for breaching. So I said before that we we're going to come back to sentencing. And so here we are with um, pleas of guilty for 
sentences. In the local court, if somebody pleads guilty in the local court, then they are given a 25% discount. For people that have to go to district court or Supreme Court because their case is considered too serious to stay in the local court, then if they have pled not guilty in the local court and gone to the district court or Supreme Court for trial, if they change their mind and decide to plead guilty, then if they do that, more than 14 days before the trial date, then they can get 10% discount off their sentence. But if they wait longer and don't plead guilty until five, oh, sorry, until 14 days before the trial date, then they can only get a 5% discount. Um, our, our slide there says day of trial, but it's actually down the bottom. If it's less than 14 days before the day of the trial, then it's only 5% discount. So we encourage the person, if you're going to plead guilty, if you're thinking about pleading guilty, do it in the local court because you, you maximise your discount 25%. If you decide to plead guilty later, the discount is now only at the most 10% or worse, 5%. Um, if somebody pleads not guilty and goes to trial and loses the trial, there is no discount. If somebody goes to trial and wins, then you don't need to be sentenced. So if they win, they win. But you can't get a discount if you never pled guilty. But the timing of pleading guilty is really important. And so when you're um, interpreting in conferences with the lawyer, this is something that will be discussed or should be discussed with the client. The client has to receive advice about their discounts, about dis available discounts. The lawyer must give this advice. Even if the person says, I want to plead not guilty, the lawyer must still give them the advice about available discounts, depending on the time of when you plead guilty, if you do. Now, do we want the break now or, or do you want to do this slide and keep going? Perhaps because we started um, a bit after the hour, I, I thought we might just go yeah. do this slide and then take the break. No problem, no problem. Okay, so sentences, uh, we have full-time prison is the worst that you can get. That's obviously, that's the worst situation. And a sentence of imprisonment is broken into two parts. It is served partly in the community and partly in prison. So you get a non-parole period, which means the compulsory minimum time that you must do in prison, that's non-parole. And the magistrate or the judge will set that time. You can't get released before then. Even if you're good behaviour, you cannot get released before you've done that minimum non-parole period. Once you are released on parole, once you've served that minimum time, you're on parole in the community under supervision by corrective services. And you have a case officer, you go to meetings, they might drug test you, they might send you to courses, things like that. If somebody gets life, that means they die in jail. It's for their whole life, the rest of their life. Life means life in New South Wales. And intensive correction order, ICO, is important to realise this is a prison sentence. It's a very serious sentence, but it is served in the community under supervision with conditions. It must be of good behaviour. You are supervised by corrective services. You have other conditions. You may have to go and get treatment. You may have to, you may have home detention. You may have to go and do community service um, or various, various other conditions. You may have to go to re rehabilitation, go and live in the rehabilitation centre, 
etc. So there will be conditions. And if you break these rules, then the parole board will decide whether you go straight back to jail or not, or you get a diff another chance. But an intensive correction order, the maximum period that you can get for that is a two-year order if it's one charge. If it's two or more charges, then the most you can get is three-year intensive correction order. But break it and you're in big trouble. You face going back into jail or into jail and serving the time in jail. And it's the parole board that make that decision, not the court, if you're going to be sent back to jail. So that's an intensive correction order or ICO. It's better than full-time prison for the person, but it's hard and a lot of people do break them. Community Correction Order, CCO, this is not a jail sentence. It does carry a conviction. It is still serious. You are convicted. It is on the criminal record, but it's not a jail sentence. There are conditions, though, and you may be supervised or not. Usually, yes. You have to follow rules and, and conditions. You must be a good behaviour. You may have to go and do courses that community uh, that the community corrections officer at corrective services tells you to do you have to follow their rules if you break the rules including if you do another crime then you will have to go back to court so not the parole board but you have to go back to court and they will decide what to do should we give you a different sentence maybe a more severe sentence uh, or continue and change the conditions. But so it's a problem. If, if the person breaches this or breaks this, then there can be a problem. Um, you have to go back to court and face the possibility of a worse, harsher penalty. Conditional release order, CRO, is similar to a community correction order. Again, it's not a jail sentence and it's intended for something less serious, less serious again. And there may or may not be a conviction. So it might be somebody's first offence and it may not be as serious as some other charges. Community release order, um, but there may be conditions for supervision or not. It may be conditions to go and get some help with a problem like mental health or physical health, um, drugs or something um, for a set period. If you break it, then you go back to court and, and face the risk of getting a higher penalty. The court can also impose fines um, and they'll take into account whether somebody's employed, whether they can afford the fine or not. So some offences... You, you can be fined and you or you can get a section 10 subsection 1 subsection a and that is where the charge is dismissed and so it's found to have been done but no criminal convictions recorded so that's usually when somebody is first time in trouble they'll be given another chance so no conviction is recorded for that Section 10, capital A, you are convicted, but there's no other penalty. There's no fine. There's no jail. There's no good behaviour bond. It's just conviction with no other penalty. So there's some of, they're the sentences that are available. Thanks, Helen. Um, and thank you, our audience. We'll just pause the recording and take a five-minute break now and return at 10 past 12. I'll move on to the next slide now. Okay, so this is how a sentence is structured, a full-time prison sentence is structured. I briefly touched on this. Um, I should apologise to, hopefully I'm not speaking too fast. Um, I apologise if I am. And 
um, but I think that we can, this is recorded and that we can po probably send you a copy of the slides, uh, the PowerPoint, if you wish to have a copy of the PowerPoint, which has the words and has what we've been speaking about. So Thanks, Helen, I, I'll just mention that I, I did um, upload the a copy into the chat and I've emailed it to everybody who registered. Perfect, thank you. Um, so a prison sentence, full-time prison sentence, is something which is served in inside prison uh, in two parts. You have a non-parole period, which is the minimum time, example, six months, example, two years, example, five years, that the magistrate or the judge sets. That is the minimum time. It cannot be shortened. It cannot be shortened by being of good behaviour in prison. In I know uh, in America that they do get out for good behaviour. I think England as well, you can be released with good behaviour. With us, you can't. That that's when the magistrate or the judge sets the non-parole period, that's the minimum time you're going to do. Um, then the second part of the sentence, when you are released on parole, is the parole period. And that is served in the community under supervision by an allocated community corrections officer, depending on the, like, where you're going to live. If you're going to live in the city of Sydney, then there'll be an office in the city of Sydney and you have to go to appointments. Or if you're going to be in Campbelltown in New South Wales, then you will go to the Campbelltown office of community corrections and you'll be allocated a case officer and they might do drug tests on you or they might send you off to anger management courses or drug and alcohol courses and they expect the person to do what they are told. Um, it is an offence, it is a crime to, obviously it's a crime to do something, another crime while on parole and that brings me back to the beginning when we spoke about bail and show cause if you commit a crime while on parole then it makes getting bail on the new charge difficult because you have to explain why you should be given a chance to get bail on the new charge when you've just done something allegedly while on parole for this old charge so it creates problems, creates hurdles. The, so the person is still serving their jail sentence when they're released on parole. The sentence hasn't finished yet. And so you have to be of good behaviour. You, you, you have to follow all the rules. And uh, so if somebody yeah, commits a new offence, then they can be refused bail and that will also affect the, the commencement date of the new sentence. The judge will go, well, when do I start the new one? You've done this while you're still serving the old sentence. What am I going to do with you? So it, it affects the commencement date for the new sentence. And whether you get parole is another question because if the sentence is three years or less, then parole, being released on parole, is automatic. So, for example, the judge gives somebody a three-year sentence with a two-year non-parole period. So they must do two years non-parole in jail. Then they spend one year on parole. But if the sentence, the total sentence, is more than three years, so, for example, the judge says, four-year sentence with two-year non-parole, they are not automatic re automatically released on parole in two years. They must apply for parole from the state parole authority. The parole authority can say no. That's when they look at your behaviour in prison. If you're always getting into fights, um, etc., be bad behaviour in prison, you may not get released on parole in two years, you may spend longer and I have to apply again. 
So I always tell my client, you, know, you, you need to behave in jail because it's up to the parole board whether they release you. So to, just to recap, a sentence of three years or less, total sentence, automatic parole. A sentence which is three, uh, which is three days and sorry, three years and one day or more, parole is not automatic. You have to apply for it. So it's really important that person behaves well in custody. Um, that's yep, yeah, that's parole and behavior in the community while under supervision, very important as well. And the structure of the sentence can change if you get a finding of special circumstances. There's no set definition of what constitutes special circumstances, but an example, there's, it can be any one thing or it can be a combination. It could be it's a person's first time in jail. They might be 18 years old or they might be 85 years old. They might be 55 years old and have no criminal record. It's their first time in jail. Or they might have a mental health issue, which makes jail much harder. They might have a cognitive impairment issue, which, of course, makes them very vulnerable in prison. They might have a physical health problem where it's going to be harder to get the specialised treatment for that in jail. They might have, they might be from a community which is where there are not many people from that community in prison. So there are not many people for that person to speak their language to. So they're going to be very isolated in jail. They might be isolated because all their family is overseas and they can't get any visits. That isolation may create a situation where the judge considers that there is special circumstances. So what does that do to the sentence? Having special circumstances enables the judge to uh, sorry, alter the structure of the sentence. So normally you have a sentence which has three quarters or 75% of the sentence in jail as non-parole period. So three quarters or 75% of the sentence is in jail non-parole period one quarter or 25 percent is on parole in the community under supervision those are the two parts 75 percent 25 percent if you find special circumstances then the judge can reduce the non-parole period so maybe they'll structure it 50 50 or 60 40 reduce the time in jail non-parole period extend the time on parole in the community and that's what we're aiming for as defence lawyers we want less time in jail more time in the community on parole so we're always asking for special circumstances if it's going to be full-time jail sentence in my job i have a lot of clients with mental health issues and cognitive impairment issues and this uh, uh, people with mental health issues are overrepresented in the prison system unfortunately it does not mean that they are more likely to commit crimes but unfortunately a lot of people in jail have mental health issues and it can be very hard to get the proper treatment in jail it's it's really sad um, Mental health legislation changed in 2020 and came into a new one came into effect 2021. So, but we still have these things. Fitness hearing is when somebody is not capable of maybe they can't understand what's happening. And, and I don't mean can't understand because of language, they can't understand because of their mental health or cognitive impairment issue they don't know what's going on in court no matter how many times you explain it to them they don't they're not capable of understanding it and for the lawyer you realize this when they keep asking you the same question because they're not understanding the advice no matter how 
much you explain the court process that they don't remember you what you've said or they don't understand it's not a language issue it's a mental health issue um or they might have um they might be paranoid about the role of the judge or the prosecutor they might think you the lawyer are against them they're paranoid because of their mental illness they're really paranoid about everybody's role in the proceedings or they don't understand their lawyer's role even when you explain it to them they don't understand they're unfit that they're unfit for trial they're unfit so this is something that gets dealt with in district or supreme court um, and also local court they're unfit to participate properly in their own proceedings Special hearing is something that's dealt with, that's something in the higher courts. Local, uh, local court doesn't have special hearings. A district or Supreme Court can have special hearings and they have been found by the court to be unfit for the trial. So they come back to court after, sometime after being reviewed by the Mental Health Review Tribunal, being psychiatrically assessed or assessed by psychologists if it is an intellectual impairment and they still have like a trial but with only a judge so there's no jury in a special hearing there's no jury in a fitness hearing either for that matter so the judge hears the evidence watches the evidence lawyers make submissions you can still be found not guilty if if the prosecution have not proven the offence or the judge can think that on that evidence that the person did do the crime and they can be given penalty just like anybody else uh, but with an unfit person going through a special hearing it's very hard because they may not be able to give you their, their side of the story very well and that has to be taken into account that they are not able to defend themselves properly their lawyer is trying to defend them with based on very limited ability of that person to fully participate in their case so it's hard to represent people that that cannot explain their side of things at all or very well because of their health issues when somebody is found unfit and when somebody goes through a special hearing, they are reviewed by the Mental Health Review Tribunal, which is not a court, it's a tribunal. And you have a re usually a retired judge. You may have a barrister or a psychologist, um, different people sitting, listening to um, the evidence they'll get reports from psychiatrists treating the person in jail or from psychologists if it's a cognitive impairment and they will look at the person's health are they responding to medication what are the, where should we keep these people some people are in the community they're, they're on bail how how are they going with their treatment in the community or their treatment in jail? Should we, does, is, there, is there a recommendation for a change in medication? Um, are they becoming well because they've been medicated? Are they becoming fit now? So some people start off unfit because they've been unmedicated for so long. Maybe they haven't taken their medication, but once they're medicated, their mental health may improve and they may start to understand things and they may become fit and that's great so the tribunal may say well this person's fit now so then they can go back to court and go through the normal process fit give their lawyer their proper version of events and participate in the process better so some people do become fit but some people never do and if the intellectual impairment is so so much that, that they may never become fit because medication doesn't solve that so it, they're very these people are very very vulnerable um vulnerable in the community and even more vulnerable if they're in jail 
community treatment order. So there might a person may have a mental health team in the community, have a doctor that refers them to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist creates a plan and which may involve medication and supervision and the mental health team in the community manages and supervises them so they may have conditions that they have to um, abide by and if they don't then they may have to go to the mental health review tribunal and they may some people end up getting detained as a as a patient when they don't want to be involuntarily detained because they're not following their community treatment order. Section 14 is dealt with in the local court. That's only for charges that can finish in the local court. And it is, it's a diversion. So you're not convicted, you're not sentenced for the crime, but you are put on a treatment plan written by a psychiatrist or a psychologist and you have to follow go and get your treatment take your medication and for maybe six months you, know, you have to keep doing that and if you don't do it the doctor has to report you to the court for not doing it and then you come back to court and maybe your case is dealt with the criminal law way so section 14 not convicted not sent to jail the idea is to get yourself, get the person treated, make sure they are on a treatment plan. Sort of don't, don't put them in jail, just get them, make sure they're treated. So that's a section 14 in the local court, but only things that stay in the local court can be dealt with that way. And the magistrate has a choice not to deal with it that way. If they think the charge is too serious, they can say, no, we're going to deal with this under the criminal legislation and, and impose one of those other penalties that we dealt with um, community correction order intensive correction order jail that sort of thing um, so then we have not guilty on the grounds of mental illness that's the old terminology you may still hear it but now um, we have act proven but not criminally responsible due to mental health impairment or cognitive impairment so cognitive impairment is intellectual impairment um, and you're usually treated by a psychologist or a neuropsychologist whereas mental illness is treated usually by a psychiatrist and so the new verdict is act proven which means did the action did the action but not criminally responsible, so not convicted, not found guilty, not criminally responsible due to the mental impairment or the cognitive impairment. That's the new phrasing. That's the new wording of the verdict. So we, we don't say not guilty on the grounds of mental illness anymore. And the legislation expanded to bring in cognitive impairment defence as a possibility because people with an intellectual impairment or cognitive impairment to the extent that they didn't know what they were doing was wrong can now have that defense available to them but in the past they didn't so the impairment the defense the impairment defense is about not knowing that what the person did was wrong morally wrong or didn't know the, understand the nature and the quality of what they were doing. You have a lot of these in, in the Supreme Court, in murder matters. That's where this is um, very commonly held. And I have three of these at the moment. I have three murder matters at the moment where this is a relevant defence, the um, act proven but not criminally responsible due to mental health impairment. Um, because the mental illness was so affecting the person's thinking at the time that they were incapable of understanding that what they were doing was 
morally wrong. In fact, they felt so justified because of delusions or what what was going on in their mind. It, it really affected their thinking. With medication, they can start to realise that, that that wasn't the right thing to do or that the delusion wasn't real. So it's it's very sad, actually. But it's a big part of criminal law as well, as I've got three of these cases at the moment. There's some American words, you know, in Australia we have a lot of um, American shows. So these words, misdemeanor, we don't have that. that my understanding is it's a less serious offence. Um, we don't use that word. We also don't say first or second degree murder. We have murder, manslaughter, and we have different types of manslaughter. Um, we have manslaughter by unlawful and dangerous act. We have manslaughter by excessive self-defense or manslaughter by substantial impairment, uh, by abnormality of mind being one of mental health or cognitive impairment. Um, early release for good behaviour. As I said, I think that happens in the US and the UK. Uh, we don't have that here in New South Wales. And we don't call it plea bargaining. We negotiate, but we don't call it plea bargaining. We enter into negotiations with the prosecution, but um, we, don't, we don't actually use the term plea bargain. Thank you, Helen. That brings the uh, slides with words that Helen will explain um, to the end. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody in the audience for attending and listening to today's webinar. Mm -hmm. And just to let you know that if you are interested in legal aid publications, if you go to the legal aid website, which is legalaid.nsw.gov, Dot au, uh, you can um, click on the drop down menus at the top of the page and um, go to the publication section. Um, and there are publications that you can order and they can be ordered. Uh, some of them can be ordered in a range of different languages. And also on the Legal Aid website um, under workshops, um, and webinars, uh, you can look at the community legal education page for upcoming webinars and face-to-face -face workshops. And from there, you can also subscribe uh, to our electronic alerts to find out about upcoming uh, webinars and other um, things that we're doing in the community legal education branch. So I know that Helen has, um, been very efficient and answered some questions um, going through, uh, but we have allowed plenty of time for questions yeah. and I can see that we do have some. Yeah, I haven't and... got to you all yet, so I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Helen, we, we did also have some people submit um, some words that they uh and some questions prior to the webinar. So I thought I might quickly run through those first, if that's Absolutely. okay. Yeah. Um, so I, there were sort of some general questions uh, about um, the role for interpreters. Uh, there was a question about common courtesy rules for interpreters um, in the court setting and a question about confidentiality with interpreters. And I wondered if you had anything to say about those. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if the question means for the um, for the interpreters, what, the name of the interpreter to be confidential or the documents that the interpreter is asked to translate or, or confidentiality in the sense of the conference where you're interpreting. Um, yeah, perhaps um, if the person who submitted that uh, is attending, they could clarify that for us. Uh, 
There's another question, what can an interpreter expect if they are asked to interpret um, on sentence in a criminal case? Is there anything in particular that you might have to say about that? Uh, what In a sentence, um, the sentence hearing will involve the prosecution handing up, usually depends if it's agreed facts, uh, that will be a document, agreed facts. You may have to interpret when a witness, uh, the accused might give evidence at sentence to talk about their personal life, to talk about how sorry they are for the crime. So you might be interpreting while the accused, while I should say the offender, if they're pleading guilty, while they are talking, or you might be interpreting for the offender when the judge is talking and the lawyers are talking. The lawyers will be making submissions, how serious the offence is, what's not so serious. The lawyers will be talking about what they say is the appropriate penalty in court, so all of those types of sentences. They might be arguing it should be full-time jail or they might be arguing that it should be an intensive correction order. Um, you might... I did a, one sentence, I gave the interpreter a copy of the written submissions um, of the prosecution and the defence so that they could have a look at it to get an idea about what the case is about and what the prosecution have written and what the defence lawyers have written so that they have an idea of what what, what is this about? What charges is this person being sentenced for? And what is the basic submission? What are the issues in the case? So by all means, ask um, the prosecutor or the defence for a copy of the agreed facts, just so you know what, what sort of charges this case is all about. Um, it's okay to ask for documents and they should give it to you. I, I give documents to interpreters when I have them available. Um, and, yeah, so th there'll be some documents. There'll be some, obviously, they'll be talking. And or you might be interpreting when the judge is, judge might be reading out those agreed facts as well, which is all the more reason why you want a copy of those those facts so that you can see what is being said and you can hear it and see it at the same time. So that's what you can expect in sentence hearing. And Helen, uh, uh, another person had asked um, for an explanation of submissions and representations. Yep. So submissions can be both written. I'm just making it. Submissions can be written and oral. So when I do a sentence, I write my argument out and I give that to the court a week in advance. Uh, bail application, I do written submissions as well. So I've got all my points, my arguments written out. I've quoted parts of the law, different cases. What is the legislation? So I've got it all written. Judge or magistrate can read that. I have to give a copy of that to the prosecution. But then I also speak in court. So I'll make oral submissions as an argument. Or when I say argument, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a conflict, but it's a it's my, my argument, my submission, that this is the appropriate penalty or that my client should not be sentenced to prison because they have a rehabilitation bed to go to. They've done all these positive things in the community. So it's my, I'm asking the court, I'm submitting to the court, I'm asking the court, please consider all these things. That's that's my submission about appropriate penalty. Um, so in writing and orally. Um, and sorry, there was another word. Uh, representations. Representations is something that I make to the police or DPP, the Director of Public Prosecution Solicitor. I'm making a submission, really, a representation to 
for them to consider withdrawing a more serious charge and, and accepting a plea of guilty to something less serious. Or I might be asking them, I might be making a representation or a submission in writing that they should withdraw and stop the criminal proceedings altogether. I'm asking them to withdraw all the charges because I'm saying, I'm arguing, I'm submitting that there is no evidence to prove the case against my client or not enough evidence. So that is my submission. That's my representation to them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was also a question about bench books. Yeah, so they are on the internet, in fact. Um, if you Google um, Judicial Commission bench book, um, can we put that in the chat somewhere? Yeah, sure. So if you Google Judicial, Com uh, Judicial Commission bench book, Google that, there'll be sentence bench book and trial bench book and civil and criminal, and that is that the judges have access to that, everybody has access to that, and it, it can be, sets out some explanations and um, legal explanations to, that the judge can give to the jury, explaining different defences, different offences, what is robbery, what the prosecution must prove, that's interesting reading the judicial commission website also publishes statistics of sentences for different crimes different statistics of penalties and often we will use those in court as well to show the court well 50 percent of people got jail but 50 percent of people did not for that crime so yeah it's interesting it's an interesting website the judicial commission website um, New South Wales and bench books are there. Thanks Helen. Someone else asked about the meaning of voir dire. Voir dire comes from the French and uh, in practice um, it is without the jury so it's in in the absence of a jury in a trial and it is you bring a witness into court, ask them, ask them some questions. It's recorded, it's transcribed, and it might be because you, you that maybe they haven't made a statement, or maybe there's something new. They've made a brand new statement, and you need some. You need a chance to ask them. Both sides might need a chance to ask some questions, so that you know where that evidence is going you know what the evidence is before you do that line of questioning in front of the jury uh, sometimes um the state or sometimes they've given a statement late like you've already left the local court and you missed out on the opportunity to cross-examine them at a committal hearing in the local court so you apply when you're in the district or supreme court to have a voir dire with this of this person, test a small part of their evidence, see what it's going to be, and you might decide the answer doesn't assist you, so you will not be asking that in front of the jury, or it might help, and then you, you but you know, but it's often because there's some some police have given you something very late, and it's it hasn't given you the opportunity to test that before. Thank basically you. what voir dire is. Uh, another person had asked um, for some explanation of words like coercion or threaten or force in the yep. context of criminal law. So this can also be create a uh, defence of duress, D-U-R-E-S-S, -S, duress, and um, it can be a full defence. Sometimes in Commonwealth legislation, for example, um, somebody will be accused of importing drugs and they may have imported the drug, but they may have done it under duress because they may have been threatened that if they didn't, that their life would be in danger or their family's life in danger. So 
it has to be a very high level of threat and it's up to them to establish that that's not the case but they felt they had no choice because the consequence of not doing the crime were too horrible so duress um yeah that's the best example of duress or coercion um really being pressured a lot of pressure and forced to do something but yeah duress can be a full defense thank you uh some people also asked about um the phrases i put it to you i suggest to you they're often phrases used by barristers in cross-examination it can be prosecution or defence barrister cross-examining, and it's yeah, it's really a suggestion, um, suggesting suggesting a, the ne the comment that follows. You know, I suggest to you that you're lying, or you know, it, it's I suggest to you that you're lying. What do you say about that? It, it's really it's it's a statement, or I put it to you. It's it's really um making an accusation or making an accusation and, and expecting a response to that um, or I put it to you that that did not happen and the, yes it did happen no it you know usually the person usually the person will just confirm what they've already said before so that's it's it's a phrase used by used in course examination by lawyers sometimes not not everyone uses it thanks helen another person asked about the meaning of the term locus standi um i don't know i've never used that in criminal law um okay i i think uh, that re relates to whether a person has standing to to bring a claim um I've taken note of some other, I think that probably is more a civil law concept. And I'll just let people know that we do run various webinars for interpreters on civil law words, and we'll be running those again next year. And I've taken a note of those terms and um, we'll make sure that we include them um, in, in those webinars. Uh, do you ever um, have a Mackenzie friend in criminal matters, Helen? I don't know what that is, sorry. Okay, that, that's obviously a civil law concept as well. Um, so another question was, are there circumstances in which an accused person or their lawyer can request a different judge? Yes, uh, people can make an application for the judge to what's called recuse themselves or excuse recuse r e c u s e recuse it's sort of it's a suggestion to the judge or the magistrate that they have bias they perhaps they've already formed a biased view and that they should not be deciding the case now um, or maybe maybe there's also um, a personal reason. Maybe the magistrate or the judge knows the lawyer personally, close family friend, or or knows knows the victim or knows the defendant. And because it's random, you don't know who you're going to get um, allocate who, who you are going to be appearing before, and sometimes until the day of court. And that might be the situation because of a personal knowledge, too personal to be impartial, to be unbiased, then they can be asked to recuse themselves so that the matter has to go to a different um, judge or magistrate. But sometimes it's about you accusing the judge or magistrate of being biased and so you don't want to be appearing. They can refuse the application, though. They can refuse it and then you're stuck with that person. Thank you. Um, just to wonder if you could provide a brief explanation about um, when you can have a trial before a judge and when you can have a trial with a jury. 
Yeah. So very often, so default position uh, in the Australian Constitution, um, there's a right to have a trial by jury. Like it's so the default or standard situation is you have a jury that's for Supreme Court or District Court. But um, times when we may ask for a judge alone, various reasons, that, um, I've got a couple coming up. Uh, one of them is all the experts agree, prosecution and defence lawyers agree what the verdict, what the outcome should be. That is that the psychiatrists both agree that my client has a mental illness, was mentally impaired at the time of the offence, there's no dispute, there's no leave, there's no argument. And the lawyers agree that the appropriate verdict is act proven but not criminally responsible because of that mental health impairment. Judges are highly trained in the mental health legislation. Perhaps we think perhaps they understand it better than the community, perhaps. Um, and this can be done very quickly and efficiently. Give the judge some paperwork, not much summary. Here's the reports. Here's our submissions. Please make that order. It can be done in one day rather than jury trial, which can take much longer. We, we don't need to call all those witnesses. We don't need to cross-examine all those people because we acknowledge that the offence was committed. We don't need to dispute anything there is no argument there's no dispute that's a good example of having why to have a judge alone another one might be I've got another case next year where we have an intellectually impaired alleged victim and an intellectually impaired alleged offender or accused person both of them have intellectual impairments there is going to be expert evidence about the level of impairment for both and the prosecution and defence both agreed that it would be best if we have a judge only dealing with this, with that case. So that one's already agreed. Uh, we, we signed a form, prosecution signed the form, we've given it to the court and the court has no choice if we both agree. If the prosecution do not agree to judge a loan trial, but we, do the, the defence, want it, then we can have a legal argument in front of a judge, any judge, about whether this should be judge alone or jury. So, yeah, if there's really no dispute on things or it might be highly technical, then you might want judge alone rather than jury if there's some sort of expert technical expert evidence or if there's absolutely no dispute why not just let it go just straight to the judge um, but on the other hand sometimes you want 12 people you don't know which judge you're going to get either you know you might have some a judge that doesn't understand the issues or has a reputation for being very biased against defense or prosecution you, you may not want to risk that either sometimes you might think that you're better off with 12 people from the community. So there's no right or wrong answer, um, but most of my trials are with jury. Most of them are with jury. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is something that you come across in the criminal law context, but a, a question has been asked about what a prescribed applicant is. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know what that is. So I'll just let our audience know that there have been a few terms asked, which I think are probably more in the civil law context. Some of them I haven't heard of, but I will undertake to try and get some answers for you and um, send those responses by email after this webinar. Uh, so another question about the meaning of a spent conviction. Yeah, so at least if somebody has a criminal record, they've got some, they've got a conviction on their criminal record, but there's been nothing else for 10 years, then they can apply to have that spent. But there has to be nothing, nothing since. So more than like 10 years or more, they can apply to have that 
like wiped or their record wiped clean, so to, so to speak, spent conviction. Yeah. And I know that you did discuss the uh, term brawl in the context of one of the slides. Yeah. Uh, someone has um, asked could for clarification about the words arraignment and brawl. Yeah, so brawl, it's um, not actually a crime, but it's, it's really a fight, a physical fight is a brawl, and that might be like a fray, F, so A-F-F-R-A-Y, might be a, a brawl is usually a physical fight. It's, it's more of a slang slang word in English, um, but we uh, you often hear the word, um, but the, the crime would be an affray. And... Um, Arraignment is in the district or the Supreme Court. It is a process where the indictment, which is a charge, the charge or charges written on a piece of paper, that's the indictment, is read out to the accused person and they enter their plea to each charge, guilty or not guilty. So that's the arraignment process. Um, for example, at Sydney District Court, if you're in the Sydney District Court for anything, every court, every district court or Supreme Court will have a day where they have an arraignment list. Um, Sydney District Court's Fridays, and you, you'll see some arraignments. If you go up there into Court 3.1 on Level 3, you, you'll witness some arraignments, people um, having their charges read out and pleading not guilty. You'll also see the arraignment. If you're interpreting in a trial, you'll see the accused be arraigned in front of the jury. The charges will be read out and they will formally say not guilty in front of the jury. So that's they'll be arraigned again right in front of the jury. So the jury hears all the charges and hears what they say about them, not guilty. And then the trial starts. Thanks, Helen. Um... There's a question about uh, correctional facilities and what are the obligations for them to provide access to interpreters? Um, the questioner is aware of um, deaf people being in jail for long periods of time with no access to communication. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, Helen, uh, or not. It's very frightening if that's the case. Um, there's a couple of aspects to that. When I, ha when I have a jail visit, either by in-person or video or phone with a person who needs an interpreter, with a client who needs an interpreter, I book interpreter and I tell corrective services that my conference needs an interpreter. So I, I organise that. I do have, I do wonder whether people that need interpreters for medical reasons that are and they're in jail or any other reason whether they have access to interpreters or not um, I did have an issue where my client needed clothing for court court needed court clothing I had taken the clothing for court to the jail myself and when he came to court and he wasn't in court clothing that I'd given him he was in his prison track suit which is really bad we can't have the jury see that and I rang Parkley and it, my client needs an interpreter and um, they said well he has to fill out a form he has to tell the officer I said well he needs help with that because he needs an interpreter he does not speak English and the comment um, back that I got was extremely ignorant and racist. Um, and I'll just explain my client's Mandarin speaking Chinese. And the person said, well, there's lots of Asian inmates here. I said, and my response was they don't all speak the same language. Like he needs an interpreter. He does not know. I don't know what form he has to fill in. He won't be able to fill in a form. He needs his court clothes. He needs help. And the court case cannot continue until you put his clothes with him and he comes to court wearing his clothes. And um, it just made me very angry that 
clearly this person has got no concept of people needing interpreters or that different languages are different. And, um, yeah, needless to say, the very next day he was in court clothes because um, I think she was worried that I was going to make a complaint about her racist comment, but um, they're terrible. And I do worry whether some clients, whether they bother to get interpreters for medical appointments. Uh, I worry about that. I hope that's answered the question. Um, but jails should be making mm. access to interpreters. It's To me, it's a fundamental fundamental right as far as I'm concerned. Um, yes, definitely. Uh, and I, I should say that um, our human rights um, team in the civil law division um, do a lot of work um, and they've, they have um, been working on um, access to um, health um, when, for people in correctional facilities and trying to address some of these issues that are raised um, by people who are in correctional facilities. Um, there's a question... I'm not sure if if you would know this, Helen, or if it might need to be directed to um, court registries, but do interpreters still have to disclose their full name in courts or is their ID number sufficient? Um, my When I've seen interpreters be sworn in or affirmed, I've seen interpreters be asked to present their card, like their ID card, interpreter card, and... Um, the court officer and the judge has a look at it or the judge's associate makes a note of the name and the number. So there is a record of who it is. I can't recall. Sometimes I've heard the judge ask the name of the interpreter in open court. So I don't think the number's enough. The card does have to be produced. Thank you. Another question, is there a difference between remand and custody? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so you can be on remand in custody. Um, you can be in custody at the police station because you've been arrested. You can be in police custody at the police station. You are on remand in prison waiting for your case to finish in court. So if, if somebody is not yet sentenced... They might be on remand for one year before they are sentenced or they might be on remand, bail refused, in custody of the jail for one year until their trial. Um, yeah, when you, you can be remanded in custody. You, you might hear the magistrate or the judge say, remand the person in custody. So I hold them in custody. Hopefully that makes sense. The two words can be used in the same sentence. Um, but if, you, if you're in custody of police, you are not remanded yet. You're, you're remanded in jail and you're on remand in jail waiting for your case to be finalised. Once you're sentenced, then you're serving your sentence. You're no longer on remand you're sentenced, your status, your classification changes. Thank you, Helen. Uh, the next question is, uh, what does this carries a conviction actually mean? Um, you are, you're found guilty. You are convicted. It's on your criminal record. Sometimes the conviction may be all, if it's one of those section 10 capital A, conviction no other penalty um you might be convicted and fined convicted and given an intensive correction order convicted and given a community correction order Com convicted and given a community release order convicted and given full-time prison um often when as soon as somebody enters their plea of guilty in the local court they might be convicted so the plea is recorded, convicted, but you're not yet sentenced. You, you might then have to go, you'll go another day and be sentenced another day, but the conviction is recorded. 
Thank you. Uh, a question about whether there is any difference between the terms jail and prison? Um, there probably are, but to me they're fairly interchangeable. Um, I'm not sure whether one is like more, I know there's county jails and things like that, so maybe one is, I'm not 100% sure, maybe one is we have like remand, you're on remand, some of the some of the jails have remand sections. Maybe that's jail and prison is when you're serving your sentence. I'm not sure, so, so don't quote me on that. I'm not. I'm actually not. I think I use them interchangeably, but some places may actually have a bigger distinction. Is there a difference between charge and indictment? Um. You have sort of covered yeah, yeah, indictment. Yeah. yeah, so everyone is charged with a with a crime or, or charges laid against somebody. Not every charge goes up to district or Supreme Court. So they, there won't be an indictment presented in the local court, but you do you do have a charge. So, uh, and, the, and the charges will be written on the indictment. The document's called an indictment. So the charges will be written on the indictment. Uh, when you spoke about um, interpreters asking for a copy of the documents, um, someone has asked if they should ask the registrar, but I think you were referring to them asking the prosecutor. Yeah, ask the prosecutor or the defence lawyer um, if you can have a copy of, you know, the fact, the agreed facts or the fact sheet, um, depending on the context of what, what you're being asked to interpret. Um, the indictment, definitely ask the indictment because the court registry may not have the documents yet. But they may, the lawyers may bring them into court and hand them up at court. So they may not be at the registry yet. Um, some things there won't be an available copy of, but I think when you're asked to be interpreting something on the spot, that you should be able to have a look at it and see it. Uh, also, someone asked why lawyers are reluctant to let interpreters have a look at documents. I don't know. Um, I don't agree. I try to let people have a look at it because um, it's a very important role that you do it and it's a difficult you know, to do something on the spot, especially with if there's medical and legal words in there. Um, and to be hearing it, like, it's very, I appreciate, I respect the job that you do because it's not easy. You might find your job easy, but I don't think your job is easy. And it, we want it to be accurate and being able to have a look at the document, I think, assists in when you hear it and you can see it at the same time or being able to read a document to give you an idea of the context like, you know, when I gave the person the submissions, at least before the case started, they could read it to see what sort of charges it was, and get the idea of what this case is all about um, so that the words make sense in context. I think it's so important. And, like, for example, um, Friday I've got it, um I've got a conference with a client and an interpreter and I have a document which I need translated. So I've given it already for an interpreter. I've booked a translator to translate the document so that when we have our conference, the translator will read the document in the language, Punjabi is the language, trans, uh, read the document to the client because I'm not sure how Le the level of his literacy and he has mental health issues so I want it read to him so he hears it all in Punjabi but there's no way I wanted to make the interpreter have to translate and then speak 14 pages on Friday I want them to have be prepared before we get to Friday so you've got several days to work out the translation and then They'll speak in court. Um, 
because there's no it would just be a nightmare and it's medical language and lots of stuff so I just think give somebody time to do their job properly and I think the other problem you have is that many lawyers if they haven't ever or judges if they haven't ever tried to learn another language they've got no idea how hard it is to think in more than one language and to you know translate and interpret back and forth no idea if they've never tried or they're not bilingual or multilingual so ignorance. yes and that's why we run these webinars because we're conscious of the the fact that there are so many there's so much terminology used in in the law that um is not ordinary english um that a lot of Australians don't necessarily have an understanding of or native English speakers have not necessarily have an understanding of. Um, okay, so there was, uh, sorry, I'm just going back up to make sure I haven't missed any questions. I don't know if you struck this, but um, what an interpreter should do in the case of an accusation of incorrect or false interpreting whether that's ever happened in matters that you've been involved in um I think that if there's an issue then I mean depends who's raised the issue I, I think there's always a capacity for it to be checked because court is recorded audio recorded um and there's like when you see the green light in court it means it's been in the district court the, the recording's happening and then it's transcribed so an audio um an audio recording can be obtained of that and it can be checked um what was said it, it, the translation uh, sorry the interpreting can be checked uh, so maybe the court proceedings need to be stopped from temporarily so that that can be done that the interpreting can be checked against listening getting a copy of the audio and listening to it um, if somebody's defending an allegation by all means get, apply for the audio um, if somebody's being accused of interpreting wrongly you can apply for the audio to prove your innocence you're like hey this is this is what was said in court this is my interpretation you can hear it and somebody else can check it and say it was totally accurate or that's one way of saying it and another way would be this but yes it's correct there there is an audio recording it it can be checked thank you uh someone's asked for the meaning of the crown case crown case is so the crown is the prosecution and the reason we call them the crown is because australia is part of the commonwealth of British British Commonwealth the crown is now the king used to be the queen the case is it's their their version their story their witnesses story so um their theory of what happened whether they can prove it's another question but that's the crown case so so the crown case statement is also is a document that is will be um handed up to court it's like similar to the police fact sheet it's a summary of the evidence in the brief according to the prosecution it may be something that we we agree that's an accurate summary we the defense or not but a crown case is their version of events and um the term prima facie um sort of it's like sort of at first blush like at there's basic basic um basic case at first glance there's a basic case to answer um, if there's no prima facie case then it means that it's sufficient you're asking for this to be discharged it, um, stop the proceedings now discharge right now because um there is no basis for this to keep going there's no basic there's no and not enough evidence has been brought to court to prove this on the on the basic level thank you helen um a question about what does it mean when a judge says the bail is enlarged 
I don't know. I've never heard that. I'm sorry. Mm. I've never heard that. I haven't heard that term either. Um, I can see Maxine. I can see. Um, I ask this question reinterpreters in jail that had that had access with their lawyer appointments, and that was it. No access for any instructions in the jail for management, medical welfare. Yeah, that's a real problem. Um, I think that's a human rights issue, as Bridget mm. was mentioning, mm. and yeah, I think yeah. I think the gov I think the governor should the governor of the jail something should be said to the like see what if they could um, the governor to the jail. I don't know about you know the captions on the TV if they could be assisted with that. Um, yeah, but, but in terms of medical and having to deal do everyday activities in a language that they don't know, I think that's that's a problem. Um, yeah, and they may wish to, um, if you're still in contact with the person, they you might wish to encourage them to um, uh, seek access to some legal advice. Yeah, and we about do have that situation. And we have prisoners legal service and we can get interpreters on the phone as well. But again, yeah, it's hard if they don't know because of the language difficulty that these services are available. Yeah, it's it's mm. very, very difficult for the person. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, there's a question about whether the Judicial Council for Cultural Diversity's recommended national standards for working with interpreters are mandatory reading for lawyers. Um, I actually went to the launch of the second um, at, uh, at the Supreme Court building. I actually went to the launch of that. It's not mandatory, but I, I would hope that people... I've seen the documents sort of being forwarded around at Legal Aid. I've seen the document. Um, I've looked at it. I, I said I went to the launch, the, the ceremony. Um, it should be mandatory. We work with interpreters all the time. I, I think it's something that should be mandatory. Um, but as far as I know, it, it isn't mandatory. But I wish that it was. Thank you. Uh, a question about how much flexibility there is for interpreters to interrupt and ask for clarification during court proceedings? I think you should if you need to. Um, I think that you absolutely should, if, if even if it's in the middle of the, yeah, the accused's answer or, you know, or the witness's answer, the, you know, you, you can raise your hand and, and ask, or, or the lawyer, the clarification from a, a word or that the lawyer has used, by all means, ask for clarification of that word. Please don't be embarrassed or ashamed. It's better that you get clarification so that there is no misunderstanding by you or by the person that has to then answer the question. It's better to clarify it than not. And if the court doesn't like it, well, I'm sorry, do they want accuracy or do, or do they want some misunderstanding? That they should be understanding that, that there are times when clarification is needed and, and also context. If you don't know the context and, and some languages also don't differentiate between he and she, the sound of it's the same, you might need to clarify is that a man or a woman so that you can put it into English because in English there is he and she but some languages don't he and she sounds the same and if you don't know the context if they if they're talking about a man or a woman you want to know the context of the gender of the person so that you can translate it back um accurately the context is accurate as well thank you i'm just um conscious of the time we we will finish at 1 30 um Okay. A question about what a hearing loop is. Um, Are you aware I, of that? I've seen hearing loops for, um, I've seen them for jurors as well, uh, like hearing loops and things. There are hearing loops in court. 
um, sometimes, but also for juries, uh, sometimes when things have to be played, audio or visual things have to be played, they can have the, the hearing loop. Each one has their own. Um, I don't recall seeing it being used for interpreters, but it, it might be if the interpreter is sitting in the dock, which is the part of the court where the accused person sits, then it might be, I, I think, I think it might, I think actually as amplifies by infrared or whatever. Um, there'll be like the little recording or the little amplification box. And because the interpreter will for much of the time be quite far away from where the witness is. And I think that I think that's how it might work. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but I have seen them. I've seen them in the district court. And just a question about the merit program. Um, is it ordered by the magistrate or should the um, defendant apply for it? Uh, sort of you can say you can ask to be referred to it. So then the case will be adjourned so that the person can enter into that program. So like you you would, it would be raised as, you know, that this person would like to participate in the merit program and then come back for sentence later. And the magistrate will usually, if they, if everything, if they look like they've got that offence and that they qualify for it, then yes, that should be okay. And then, then merit write a report that the team writes a report about the progress or about the completion or participation of that uh, in that course and you come back later to court once some weeks later once it's finished and merit it program is for drug and alcohol addiction yes. isn't yeah. it yeah 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 Uh, so someone said the hearing loop allows you to hear whatever is being caught by the microphones that are recording the proceedings. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, are interpreters using any technical equipment in court? Uh, I haven't. Uh, do you mean recordings or computers or anything? Um, I haven't seen it in criminal law. Some people do bring their dictionary. I've seen um, dictionary be brought. I haven't seen it, but I, I don't know that it's. I don't know that it's not allowed. I haven't haven't seen anybody ask to do it though. Um, okay. I guess if you, I guess if you ask the judge and the, or the magistrate and they say yes, then it's fine. Or as long as you explain what what it is for. I think that um, now covers, uh, someone asked, is there a very lengthy remand period? Can be, yeah. Mm. Some cases take, you know, two years. COVID caused lots of problems. People's trials got cancelled and because we weren't having jury trials during COVID. And if you want a trial by jury, which most of the trials are, um, they got cancelled and people did not get bail or some people did not get bail so they're still held on remand so I always warn clients that on a murder charge you might be looking at 18 months or two years from charge by police to finishing court and I'm not usually wrong about that 18 months or two years I tell the client up front because it's shocking and I need them to mentally prepare for that fact this is going to take a long time um, not because I wanted to, but I just know how slow the process is and COVID made it all worse. A lot of people, yeah, delays, cancelled trials and they have to join the queue again, more waiting time. It's terrible. Uh, Helen, um, we're almost out of time. Um, people are asking about uh, points for professional development uh, Legal Aid isn't aware of um, NATI's requirements, but we do uh, provide um, in an, our f email following the webinar confirmation that, that you have attended um, this session and we suggest that you raise it with um, your association who registers you um, as to whether they will give you points for attending. And Helen's just responding to some other questions that yeah. have come through. Yeah, 
I'll try and get to as many as I can. Um, thank you so much to everybody for your time. And yes, it's a lengthy that, webinar. I just hope that it was um that everybody feels that they benefited from it. And again, like your job is so important and we really respect the role that that you do. So thank you to all the interpreters and translators. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. And I will send a link to the recording um, from today's webinar, following the webinar once it's been uploaded. And there will be information about how you can register to receive our electronic alerts about other uh, webinars that we'll be running. Um, and thank you very much, Helen, for giving such a clear explanation of all the uh, terms relating to work in the criminal law field. Um, and there have been several um, people saying a great thank you and how much they feel they've benefited from it today. Um, and we'll, I can also download a copy of the transcript. Some people requested that and I'll send the handout again in case um, some people weren't able to access it. So we'll finish um, with the webinar now. And if there's anything that wasn't responded to, um, we'll try and respond by email after the webinar. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Helen, again. Thank you. No problem.